Well, welcome to the online summit. My name is Amy Joy Tofty, and it's my pleasure to serve as the Director of Education for NCFCA, the leading Christian Speech and Debate League. Since 2001, NCFCA has empowered Christian students to apply and communicate their worldview with skill and clarity. Through regional and national competitions, supported by exceptional training and curriculum, tens of thousands of students have learned to confidently communicate truth with grace. Thank you for joining us today for this free event. Our one-week workshop lays a firm foundation for a variety of speech and debate events. Today, we'll be focusing in on value debate. And in this session, you'll enjoy 30 minutes of live teaching, followed by some great giveaways from our friends at the King's College in New York City. And then we'll end our time together with a live question and answer session. I do want to encourage you that if you have enjoyed your time with us this week, that we have another exciting week of training next week at our NCFCA online intensive. And that is going to take all of the things that you've learned so far, build upon it, and give you an opportunity to apply it. So you'll have live interactive sessions and breakout group activities so that you can get started on your communication adventure. To get the most out of this session, we want you to fully focus on the speaker. And so we'll pause the chat box from time to time. If you have questions about NCFCA, either our resources or our competitive opportunities, please join us this afternoon at 4 p.m. Central Time and we'll answer all questions NCFCA. If you need technical assistance during the session, email summittech at ncfca.org and we'll help you as quickly as possible. And then finally, if you have questions about the specific material being presented in this session, you can submit those questions at the bottom of your screen by clicking on the Q&A button. We'll answer those questions at the end of the session. James 1.5 reminds us, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach and it will be given him. In order to make decisions, we need wisdom and we need to understand what values ought to drive our decision making. And that's what we're going to talk about today in session 13, preparing for value debate. Your instructor is Christy Scheip. Christy is the founder of NCFCA and a Region 9 NCFCA parent of five children. Mrs. Scheip authored the Comprehensive Guide to Teen Policy Debate and Lincoln Douglas value debate, and she currently serves as the NCFCA board chair. So thank you so much for being here today, Mrs. Scheip. Oh, I'm delighted to be here. I can't wait to talk about value debate. Um, if you joined me yesterday in the seminar preparing for policy debate, you're going to hear some of the same material in this one, because I'm going to talk about the foundation of debate, and that applies to both policy and value debate. So that part is the same. However, we're going to get into some details about the particulars of value debate, how it's different from policy debate, and then talk about the purpose, the purpose of value debate from a Christian perspective. Um, so first of all, I'd like to start off by taking a poll and asking what is your experience with value debate? How many of you, this is the first time you've ever heard of it, or you are a seasoned veteran, you've been competing in value debate all along or for all of high school. Um, so while you're taking that poll, I would like to just encourage you, whether you're new to this or whether you're a veteran, there's something that you can gain from this session. I really want to encourage those of you who are new by explaining what Value Debate is all about and getting you excited to do it. And for the veterans, for the experienced debaters, I want you to listen carefully as I talk about the foundation of value debate. It's very important that we approach debate um, from the solid foundation of a Christian worldview. And I think that it will help you um, to go deeper into your debate studies to really take that to heart. So um, let me just check on the poll. I'm gonna take it and then if I take it, I can see the results. Maybe. Okay, I'm not seeing. Oh, there it is. All right, so we've got mine is showing 60%. I'm new to this. That's awesome. This is excellent. And then some have participated 15% participated two plus years. 
um, and then the rest for one or or this is the first year in value debate, but you've done another type of debate. Great, that you're at the right session. Let me first assure you that debate is common to human experience. All right, you've already been debating. My dad joked that I was born debating. There's, we had several showdowns when I was even only one or two years old, um, famous showdowns between my dad and me. But, and then my daughter, the same way, my oldest daughter, um, born debaters, you know, we're gonna say, how do you know that? I disagree, what about this thing? Just naturally, we as humans, we have disagreements, that's not wrong. Um, now, a lot of times, however, our day-to-day, -day, everyday kind of debates, yeah, they can be selfish, right? We can be debating just because we wanna get our way, and that's not the way that we wanna do debate in NCSDA. There's other times though in life where we debate something because we really want to know. We really want to figure out what is the truth. We want to test ideas. We want to discover new, new things. We ask questions like, how do you know? How do you know that? How do you know it's true? How should we make this decision? Um, what is this issue really about? What is most important if i can only if if there's two good choices in front of me but i can only choose one which one should i choose and why that's kind of what value debate is about and you can see how those kind of questions again they're natural humans are asking them about all sorts of topics you've already been asking these types of questions and it's these types of questions that form the foundation of debate and of value debate um, but as we move forward, I want to give you an official definition of debate from Noah Webster's 1828 dictionary, where he says it's a discussion for elucidating truth. Now, let me break that down. Elucidating is a big word. It just means to make it clear, to make it understandable or to discover. So debate is a discussion for discovering and understanding and making clear truth. If that is our definition of debate, and I think it is a good one, it naturally leads us to a next question, which is, what is truth? What is truth? That question was actually asked of Jesus in the Bible when he was on trial at the end of his life on earth, um, when he was on trial for his life, and he was before Pilate, and he was talking about the truth, as many of us Christians do, and Pilate gives him that philosophical question. What is truth? Now, Jesus didn't answer that directly, but for the reader of John, in which that appears in John 18.38, the reader would have already read John 14.6, where Jesus does answer the question. And he said, I, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus himself is the truth. God is truth. And therefore, if debate is a discussion for making the truth clear, then it is founded upon the nature of God himself because God is truth. Jesus is truth. I'm going to share my screen now um, to just show you this principle of the foundation of value debate. So the foundation of debate, it starts with the nature of God. Now I could talk forever about the nature of God and still we wouldn't have a full understanding, but I'm just gonna hone in on a few aspects of his nature that are relevant to debate. First of all, God as a God of order and logic. When you see the way that the Bible is written, I'm right now, I'm reading Genesis, and you read that uh, Genesis chapter one where he's creating everything in order, everything after its own kind. When you just look at the universe, when you look at um, nature and science and the way everything works, it's abundantly clear. Our God is a God of logic and of order and great, great wisdom as Amy Joy shared at the beginning. Um, that's who he is. Another aspect of God that is amazing. I mean, this is 
such, bring such a joy to us. He's relational. He's relational. He's loving. He wants to be in relationship with us. The Trinity itself is in relationship, right? The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit are in this love relationship with each other. And then they created, out of that love, they created all, all that we can see, plus mankind, and desire to have a relationship with us. That, that is just amazing with me. So God is a relational God who wants to be in relationship with mankind. He is also a communicator, right? By his word, he spoke the universe into being. In order to have that relationship with us, he wrote, or through, you know, through humans, but he inspired humans to write the scriptures for us so we could know him and know about him. Again, it's, he's a communicator. As it says in John 1.1, 1, 1, Jesus is the word. Just, there's so much we could talk about there. I know you value debaters would love to get into that kind of a philosophical discussion, as would I. But suffice to say that God is a communicator. He speaks to us in so many ways. And finally, um, one aspect of God, which we already, I've already alluded to, is that he is the creator. We, where did we come from? One of those big philosophical questions that um, people have been asking for thousands of years, where did we come from? Well, we know that the answer is we came from God. He created us as part of his good creation. So that's where we start. We start with the nature of God. And we start there because it informs, as I started to talk about, who we are. What is the nature of man? Remember I said at the very beginning that debate is based on human nature? Well, that human nature comes from the nature of God. And I would just like you to use the chat here for a minute. Um, let me, I'm going to maximize my screen here so I can see the chat. Hopefully. Sorry. Um, I want to ask you to respond in the chat with, I'm having trouble, sorry. What, in what ways, just a couple of ways, in what ways is man, man's nature, like God's nature? All right, let's see if I can see that. Okay, it looks like the chat feature might be off, but just go ahead and think about that. How is man like God? First of all, we know that man was created in God's image. That's why we're like him, because obviously we're not the same as God. God is God, we are <laughs> much below him, but he created us in his image. And so those things that I was just talking about, how God is logical and orderly, relational, a communicator, the creator, we have those kind of qualities as well. Um, God gave us the ability to reason. That comes from his nature. God gives us the ability to communicate, again, from him. God gives us the ability to relate to one another and have relationship and gives us that desire to want to connect with one another. God, um, because God is creative, we are creative as well. And all of those aspects get stimulated and come into play big time in value debate. Um, and the reason that you can engage in debate is because of how God made you in his image. So we started with the nature of God because he is the truth. That's where truth comes from. And then we move to the nature of man, and then finally, we can start to build on top of that the nature of debate itself. Because like I said, it's based on human nature, the way that we think, the way that we reason, the way that we communicate, the way that we are persuaded. And all of those things are based on how we're created in God's image. When we lose those truths, and this is especially important for you veteran and experienced debaters. When you lose those truths, it can be tempting to think like, eh, I don't know if all that is true. Um, it can be tempting in debate to get too prideful and think that your own mind can understand everything. Not true, not true at all. Wisdom comes from the Lord. We must remain in re humble relationship to him to ever have wisdom. Um, 
But when we lose that, when we lose that connection to God and who he is, then we start to lose ourselves. We start to lose who we are. We don't know anymore. We don't know where we came from. We don't know where communication came from. We don't know where logic and reasoning came from. And if you accept the premise that God does not exist and everyone evolved, um, then communication, and, and this is what evolutionists believe, um, language and communication evolved and essentially man created language and man created logic. And if man created language and logic, then you can dig into those societies where you think um, logic and language came from. And you start examining those societies and you see all the flaws. Um, you know, man is a very flawed creature. And you start looking at these societies and saying, wow, they were really cruel. They were racist. They hated other people groups or they were very, um, you know, misogynistic. They were, they did not treat women well. It was all a man centered society. And when you see that, then you start to say, hey, I think this is a, a modern conception. I, I don't believe this at all, but this is what modern, um, some modern thinkers have said. If language and reasoning came from these racist and misogynistic societies, then the language itself and the communication itself and the reasoning and the logic itself is contaminated with racist and misogynistic ideas. So this became a popular theory that took the debate world by storm in the late 90s, early 2000s and kind of built to a crescendo in um, 2011 at the CETA, so that's the Cross-Examined Debate Association National Championship final round. So this is finals of the national championship of the whole nation at, at the college level. And that this is the argument that the team made. They said, we can't even debate with you. We can't have this discussion about the debate topic that we're supposed to be having because logic itself is racist and misogynistic. And because reason and evidence and all of those things and communication, the language that we're using right now to communicate with each other is inherently flawed with racism and misogyny. And so we're not gonna even engage in this debate. We're just gonna babble. And so they just said, blah, 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 and made noises for the rest of the debate round. And they were, they won. They were successful with that argument. And so that's just a warning to you of what happens when we lose God as the foundation of truth and we lose mankind as a creature created in the image of God. We have the ability to reason and speak and communicate and debate because God made us in his image. And I want you to take that deeply to heart as you start your value debate journey. Now, as we think about starting that value debate journey, um, I wanna share this image with you real quickly. Here is what debate is like in a picture. Right there. <laughs> it is like a fiery furnace where you're going to throw in a bunch of ideas. And of course, a debate means that there's opponents, right? You have two sides to the issue and two people arguing about a, a topic. And so you throw in all those ideas into the debate round. And the debate round is like that fiery furnace where all the ideas go and they get heated up and then the gold comes out of it. So debate is the idea that we're going to clash all of these things together, all of our ideas and our evidence and our reasoning and our logic. We're going to clash it. And when we clash it together, when we argue about it, not in an angry way, but just in that discussion for making the truth clear kind of a way, it acts as a fiery furnace that burns away all the bad ideas and reveals the gold of the good ideas. That's what debate is all about, that fiery furnace of ideas. And it's based on the principle that a tested idea is stronger than an untested idea. Once it's been through that fiery furnace of debate and it comes out the other side, now we can put more trust in those kind of ideas that have stood the test. 
So let's dive in now to the basics of value debate. What is value debate all about? So it is a question of what we should value that will drive our future decision making. And let me stop right here for a minute and explain a confusing thing about value debate. The word value is used in two ways in value debate, as a verb and as a noun. So I've just used it as a verb. It's a question of what we should value, right? So like I said at the beginning there, you have two really good things. I can only have one of them. Which one should I value more? All right, that's an action. I value it. Um, I raise it up in my opinion. The other way that value debate is used, the, the word value is used in the context of this kind of debate is as a noun, that there is a value that you're championing. And I know this is so confusing. I apologize. I didn't make this up. But <laughs> so uh, the two sides, like I'm talking about, there's two sides in the debate round. Um, they're called the affirmative and the negative. I'll explain that in a minute why they're called that. But just for now, no, there's an affirmative side and a negative side. So the affirmative debater will have a value, like justice or something like that. And the negative team will have a value like liberty. So I, one is an abstract noun of some kind of a, an aspirational, um, something that we really admire and respect. Who doesn't think justice is, is you know, worthy? Justice is a great idea. Liberty is a great idea. We love both of those things. But if we can only have one, which one should we put more emphasis on? So confusingly, we talk about valuing the value, right? Like I'm going to value justice and justice is my value. So hopefully that makes sense. You could, we, if it doesn't, just ask more questions about that. Let me give you an example of some value debates. First of all, I'm going to give you an example from real life that you're probably familiar with. And then I'm going to um, give an example from this year's topic. So a great example of a value debate is in the issue of abortion. Um, the value debate there is the value of the unborn child's right to life. So the value of right to life or life versus the value of the mother's right to choose. So you could see the two values as life and choice. And the question, the value debate question is which one should we prefer? This is not a question of law or policy. This is not like what should abortion laws be? Um, should the Supreme Court overturn Roe versus Wade or um, should states regulate it versus the federal government? Those are policy questions. This is just the question of which should we value more just in our hearts? The value of life or the value of choice? Um, and it might not be that we value life versus like life in every 100% of situations, although that's how it, I would lean, but um, we can ask questions in value debate about that it doesn't have to be, well, every single time, 100% of the time, without exception, we should always value life versus choice. What the value debate question is really asking is what should be the default position? Are we generally going to favor life or are we generally going to favor choice? We can talk about the details of individual circumstances and situations and exceptions and all of that. So value debate isn't really about all those kinds of detailed exceptions. It's really about a general principle. Generally, should we value life or choice? Here's um, this year's debate resolution. And in fact, I will screen share that here for a second. Um, let me make sure, here we go. There's that fiery furnace. All right, here's the, this year's debate resolution, which means this is the topic for value debate that is happening in NCSDA for this whole season, all this whole year, 2020 to 2021. Um, Resolved in democratic elections, the public's right to know should be valued above a candidate's right to privacy. So you can already see there's that value conflict. 
public's right to know versus candidates right to privacy. Which one, again, in general, should we value? Which one should we just, when we walk into the room to make a decision, we already know in our minds, well, the right to know is more valuable than the right to privacy or other way around. No, we should generally prefer the right to privacy versus the public's right to know. So this is not a question of whether or not Congress should pass laws um, regulating, you know, the medical records or tax records of candidates and forcing them to disclose that. Although that will be a discussion within this resolution, but it will not be a question of laws that we should pass or policies that should be set related to this. Again, it is just that question of which one should we prefer in general? Should we generally prefer, hey, the public has a right to know um, about a candidate before they choose. Like our democracy depends upon that. Freedom depends upon that. We need to pick virtuous leaders. We, we need to know. We should generally prefer the public has a right to know. Or the other way, no, candidates are people too. And their right to privacy outweighs the public's right to know. We need to protect, we need to go out of our way to protect their right to privacy because privacy violations are so damaging to individuals and just um, their well being in life, their human dignity. So you can see how that debate might go. It's a clash of values. And here are the two sides that I already mentioned. The affirmative side right here is saying, yes, we ought to do what the resolution says. Yes, the public's right to know should be valued above a candidate's right to privacy. And it's called affirmative because you're affirming the resolution, which just means you're saying, yes, yes, we should do this. And the other side is the negative, which I think makes a lot of sense because you're saying, no, no, we should not do this. We should not, the public's right to know should not be valued above a candidate's right to privacy. And that in a nutshell is what you will be doing this year in value debate. When you're affirmative, you'll be arguing, yes, we should do this. When you're negative, no, we shouldn't. And um, by the way, you, if you do participate in NCFCA value debate, which I would highly, highly recommend, um, you will be debating on both of these sides. And I know that's something that's surprising to a lot of new debaters um, because you kind of get in love with one side or the other. And then you think, oh my goodness, how could I possibly argue on the other side? But if you do go to a tournament, our tournaments typically have six debate rounds and you would argue three rounds affirmative and three rounds negative. What that does is it gives you a full perspective of this issue. It puts you in the shoes of the other person, of the other side, and you have to learn the arguments on both sides of this debate. Let me reassure you that this is not gonna require you to violate um, deeply held personal or religious beliefs. Um, first of all, every round is different. So when you are, you know, go into a debate round, you're gonna be debating somebody new every time. Um, everybody's case is a little bit different. You have a lot of options for arguments. There's always something, there's always good options for arguments that you can do in good conscience. These kinds of questions, the public's right to know versus the candidate's right to privacy, they're not the kind of questions that are like, is the Bible true or does God exist or is Jesus really the savior? It's not questions like that. These are questions that are about two good things. I think in a perfect world, we would wanna say, yeah, the public should get to know everything they need to know about a candidate. And yes, candidates should have their privacy respected. Like those are two good things. Um, so they really do, doesn't force you to get into areas of, you know, deeply held theology and um, argue about those kinds of things. You're arguing about which one, when you can only choose, when you, when you have to prefer, let's say it that way, when you have to prefer one, which one should be valued above the other? And Christians should be able to debate, to, debate on both sides of this issue in, in good conscience. So let me talk about, um, oh, I should mention as well that the format 
of value debate in NCFCA is called Lincoln Douglas. That is based on the old debates between Abraham Lincoln and Stephen Douglas back when they were running for Senator of Illinois. And all it means is one person versus another person. So in policy debate, it's two person teams. There's two people on affirmative and two people on negative, but in value debate, in Lincoln Douglas value debate, there's just one affirmative speaker and one negative speaker. And this is how the round goes. So you see that affirmative speaker speaks first. That is AC right there stands for affirmative constructive speech. The constructive speech is for constructing your arguments. And then there's cross-examination where after the affirmative presents their speech on yes, we ought to affirm the resolution. The negative speaker gets up and asks some questions for three minutes. You get to interact with each other that way. And then the negative gives their constructive speech and then the affirmative will cross-examine the negative speaker, another three minute cross-examination. And then there's a series of rebuttal speeches. Those are shorter than the constructive and they're designed to refine arguments down into, okay, what are the key issues in the round? We've both constructed our arguments, and now what we're doing is refining the arguments and you know, bringing it down to a few key points. What really matters? What's really at stake here? And so those are shorter speeches, and because the affirmative generally has the harder job, um, the affirmative gives a, a first rebuttal, and then the negative gives a longer rebuttal. You can see that NR there. And then the 2AR is the final speech of the round. So the affirmative rebuttal is kind of split in half into two pieces that surrounds the negative rebuttal. And that is what a Lincoln Douglas value debate round would be. So if you do a debate round, that's what you'll do in that order. Now, why? Why should you do this? You are going to gain so many amazing skills. And might I also say, have a lot of fun doing it. If you like to sit around discussing philosophical questions with your friends, this activity is for you. I can't tell you how many, like hours and hours and hours I've sat around with my kids discussing these kinds of questions. We love it. It is so much fun. Um, and so first, one of those first skills is that you will learn to think philosophically and deeply and logically about issues about so like just thinking about that abortion debate um, you're going to gain insights into what drives it what drives those discussions it's values that underlie those kinds of discussions and value debate will teach you how to discover what people are valuing when they take a position i'll tell you what it will help you discover what value you're taking when you hold a position and help you to be able to make sure that the positions you take are in line with the values you really want to hold, which I hope are biblical values and values that um, come from the Lord. It will also teach you how to consider criteria for decision making. What does that mean? What's criteria? Well, criteria just kind of means um, standards like, um, I would have a criteria, some criteria for a good meal. A good meal needs to have vegetables and fruit and protein, and I've got to have, um, I don't know, an amazing view to really enjoy that meal and amazing company. That could be my criteria for a great meal. So it just means, uh, how should we make decisions? What, what standards should we try to meet? What makes something good or bad, right or wrong, effective or ineffective? What standards should we use for decision making? Those kinds of questions you will deal with in value debate. Another skill is that you'll learn is to take a stand for something and be gracious. Um, NCFCA puts such a strong emphasis on this style of debate to really treat your opponent with respect because your opponent is your ally. They're giving your time to help you learn to debate and to practice all these skills. And finally, you will learn to persuade, uh, which is a very valuable skill. We want you to do it to persuade people 
um, on the truth and not just your own manipulation your, for your own selfish reasons. Um, but you can learn through value debate how to persuade based on an honest and ethical use of reason and emotion. And all of these skills, you're gaining all of these skills for the purpose of loving the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And those, those top two, think philosophically in constructing criteria about what, how do we make decisions, what's right or wrong, good or bad, though, that is a great way to learn to love God with your mind. And then these bottom two is a great way to fulfill the second greatest commandment, to love our neighbors as ourselves. We can learn to take a stand and be gracious and learn to persuade people um, in order to help them understand what's really valuable in life and how to make their decisions based on those kinds of values. So I hope that you will join us this year for NCSBA's Lincoln Douglas Value Debate. Thank you, Mrs. Scheip. Always, it is a pleasure to hear you speak and just to hear your heart for this activity. Our Director of Marketing, Mrs. Natalia Rosa, is going to join us now and she has some fantastic giveaways for our audience. So welcome, Mrs. Rosa. Hello. Hello. I was busy answering our participants' questions. <laughs> but we'll announce the giveaway. Thank you all for participating so well in that Q&A time and we're excited to address those questions next. Our giveaways today are provided by Regent University and the King's College and they are both giving away some really fun swag packs. So you have t-shirts and mugs and lots of fun goodies um, in the packs and our winners for those will start off with the King's College who is giving away let me confirm the number. They are giving away four swag packs. So our winners are Laura Oliveira, Soraya Leon, Paul Bass, Lily Park, and the Daly family. And then Regent University, the winner for, for that pack is Molly Lamar. If I've called your name, please email us at summittech at ncfca.org and we will help you claim your prize. Um, I'll post that in the chat so you can connect with us, but congratulations. And a quick reminder that we are still running our discount on pre-season affiliation. That will end today though, so you'll want to take advantage of that pricing. It's $50 off our regular season pricing of $150. So for $100, your family can affiliate with NCFCA for the entire year. And what that means is you have the benefit of participating in our competitions across the country. We also are gonna have competition opportunities online this year. Mm -hmm. And you receive a lot of other benefits as well. So even if you're still on the fence about competition, um, go ahead and affiliate for the year. You're going to receive discounts at the major office supply stores, which I'll tell you just the um, amount of money that you'll save from discounts on printing will make up for your affiliation costs for the year. But we also have really great partnerships with organizations like HSLDA, you can get discounts there. And um, a lot of the partners we've been mentioning this week have great scholarship opportunities and resources for NCFCA families as well. So join if you haven't already. If you have questions about that, contact our office at office at ncfca.org. And last note, we have a few slots for our online intensive, which is next week. I know a lot of you have had questions in the Q&A box about that. If I haven't gotten to all of your questions, please contact our office and they'll walk you through the process. But you can register for the intensive at ncfca.org forward slash intensive. And I think you'll really benefit if the summit has been a good experience for you. The intensive is gonna build on the instruction mm -hmm. you've learned here. So whether you're beginning or you're an advanced student, we're gonna walk you through, especially for debate, um, resolution specific training. And then you'll also get to practice and breakout activities with coaches as well. So we hope to see you next week. That's great, thank you, Mrs. Rosa. Christy, I know that you have a just a fantastic team lined up for the intensive next, next week, and we have them with us today yeah. to answer all our live question and answer. Would you like to introduce them as they come on screen? Sure. 
Um, so this is my team that's going to be teaching with me at the intensive. Go ahead. Uh, let's see. I guess Elliot, do you want to? Oh, there's Joel. Yes. And there's Elliot and Caleb. All right. So Joel Erickson. Um, I don't have your bios up, but I'm just going to introduce you <laughs> as I know you. So um, all of three, Joel Erickson, we've got Elliot Paul and Caleb Paul. Um, all three of them have competed in value debate in NCSTA. So they're all graduated. Um, Joel, I know that you're coaching as well, right? Correct. Um, Elliot and Caleb, I'm sure you have coached <laughs> too. Um, uh, but they've all done very well in value debate. They've taught other seminars and sessions. Um, they have helped me tremendously on the debate committee in NCFCA, crafting resolutions, of writing the debate cases that we use um, as samples. And you're going to get to, if you come to the intensive, you're going to get to see Joel debate Elliot on this year's resolution. It was a great round. So thank you for joining me today. That's great. Elliot, let's start with you. Uh, I know that we have two different styles of debate and there's often a debate between the two. So mm -hmm. team policy versus Lincoln Douglas value debate, which one is easier? Mm. Um, <laughs> that's a, it's a good question. It's an interesting question. Um, I got to compete for six years in NCFCA and I got to do both forms of debate. Um, I wouldn't say one is necessarily and objectively easier. I think value debate you are working with a lot more abstract and philosophical questions. Uh, with policy debate, sometimes those are a little bit more practical, like Mr. Shipe was saying, a little bit more policy and detail oriented. So I think one form or the other could be easier for a specific debater whose mind tends to find those abstract or those concrete ideas a little bit. That's easier. great. And Mrs. Scheib, do you have any recommendations for parents who are trying to guide their children? You know, your mom, you've had mm -hmm. kids walk, walk through this program. So yep. which one did you start with with your children? And just tell us why. I started with policy debate because in with my, you know, when my oldest was 12. <laughs> because in general, that kind of philosophical abstract thinking does not develop on average until about age 16. So, however, there are exceptions. And like Elliot said, if your child loves abstract reasoning and philo philosophical discussions, then value debate is perfect for them. Um, but if you have younger kids who are just aren't ready for that, I would strongly encourage you to start them in policy debate where it's more concrete, like Elliot said. And then when they get a little older, they um, will probably be ready for value debate. So, Mrs. Scheib, I know you actually debated back in the day. So we do have a question from a listener. What was your favorite? Did you prefer policy or did you prefer value? I would say value was okay. my favorite and I did better in it. Um, but that's because I love philosophy. So okay, but both types of debate are excellent. I had fun in both. But yeah, value debate. <laughs> okay, Joel, should our students go to club? Did you find club a helpful place to go? I found club to be invaluable for LD prep. Um, just because you're getting exposure to so many different other ideas from other students. Um, you can only accomplish so much preparation in your own head, in the confines of your own mind. And you need that exposure, not only through research, but through other people who are grappling with the same ideas you are. So mm -hmm. if you have a local club that's easily accessible, I highly recommend it. If you don't, there are myriad online club options available, and I would encourage you to check out some of those. That's great. Elliot and Caleb, did you guys find club to be helpful? Uh, we had the challenge of not having a lot of NCFCA participants immediately accessible to us, but we were part of some clubs that we had to drive to, and those were helpful. We also did our best to do some online club leading before the COVID pandemic. So we were already used to working things online. And I know, Elliot, that these were topics that were regularly spoken about at your dinner table. Am I right about that's, that? That is absolutely true and very yeah. helpful. Yeah. So that's my encouragement to those of you. If you don't have a local club, number one, if you want to start one, then you can contact me and I will get you started on that path. But even if you don't, you can have great conversations about these topics within your own homes. And I know Mrs. Scheib's going to be talking about that in our next session. So come back for that. Uh, Caleb, let me ask you, as, as 
you prepared for LD, what does that look like? How, how do you get started? What are the steps that you take to prepare for debate? Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a great question, especially uh, it looked like about 60% of you are pretty new. Uh, and I know that it can be extremely overwhelming. Like we've been talking about, these topics are complicated, they're abstract. If you're not used to philosophy, there's terms that you've never heard of before. Um, and we're going to be talking about this a lot more next week. Um, don't don't feel bad if you're overwhelmed by some of these things. Um, but the biggest thing is just to, to spend time reading um, to uh, to be engaged with you know the material that we've already put out the the um, resolution voting guides the uh, debate cases which will be published or, or maybe have been already um, so you want to just kind of start off reading with those and just spend time working on it and I promise it gets easier as you uh, continue to work that's great so we have a question as someone who's grown up watching policy debate and participating in it for a very long time what are your top suggestions for shifting and developing a good value debate mindset it's a great question i'll just start by kind of um continuing what caleb was saying one difference is that with policy debate you're always reading a bunch of articles and kind of like snipping little quotes from them and with value debate, that's not a great idea, not a way to start. You want to actually read whole articles, even whole books, um, learn how to scan, wisely scan a good book. But when I prep for value debate, I would just like sit in a chair reading books and thinking, <laughs> not really like cutting tons of evidence. So that's one difference. And I'll, I'll throw it out to the rest of the group. That's great. Anybody else have a thought on that? I guess just one piece of information I'll, or advice that I'll add is think really hard about the connections between the underlying philosophies and values that are at play and also how real world impacts can, can sort of play out of those underlying issues. Because that way, whichever one is your strength, you're forcing your brain to see the connection between them and therefore see how it influences the other issue. That's great. Yeah. And just to piggyback on that, if you have a background in formal logic, that's very helpful for value debate because it's more deductive logic and policy is more inductive logic, if you know what that means. I'll just leave it at that for now. <laughs> and Christy, if someone doesn't have a background in logic, how could they get one? <laughs> we do have a curriculum that contains um, logic lessons. So it's 12 value debate lessons and 12 accompanying logic lessons that will really help you gain get those skills and so it's and the ncfc ncfca comprehensive guide to value debate that's great and i i really do love the way that you integrated them so that you're presenting the the logic concepts but then you're weaving them into value debate and how you can use those in value debate so speaking of values joel can you tell me what determines a good value absolutely and we'll be doing a whole session on this in the online intensive where we delve into particulars, but some, some criteria for value to keep in mind are first, you want it to be external separate from the resolution. If you're trying to decide between the right to know and the right to privacy, you can't measure those two things with the right to privacy, because um, that's just a circular argument. Um, you also want it to be related to the resolution. If it's something that doesn't pertain to either value at all, then it's kind of pointless. Um, and you also want it to be well-defined if you have a very vague value um, you're not going to know whether or not one side is achieving it better. That's great. Let's go on to talking a little bit about the case. So we like to define our terms so that we're all debating on the same premises. So do you recommend coming up with your own definitions for value debate cases? And if so, how would you defend those? So Elliot, just talk to us a little bit about definitions and what the best practices are for that. Sure. Uh, so this is another issue that we'll be talking about more in the intensives. There's going to be a whole, a whole session dedicated to defining the round. So I would not recommend coming up with your own definitions arbitrarily. Um, certainly not as a middle school or high school student. Certainly not as a college student. Probably not even if you had a master's degree. You can't just pull a definition out of thin air. But what I do recommend doing is using some external source to pull information and then being able to defend why that definition is reasonable, why it's fair to both sides in the debate round, and why that source is credible. Now, that source could be a 18th century philosopher, it could be a modern day PhD professor, 
Um, it could be a, a dictionary. It could be an encyclopedia of philosophy. There's many good sources, as long as you can defend why it's credible and why it's reasonable. That's great. Well, sometimes those debates just kind of focus on those definitions and it just stays right there for the whole round. So what, what do you think about those? Do you find that judges get annoyed with that or are they okay with that? What do you think, Elliot? Uh, I've heard some people say that they get frustrated. Um, I personally don't mind it as long as it's called for. Um, mm -hmm. Don't be nitpicky about definitions. No one wants to watch you be nitpicky for 45 minutes. But if it matters, if that's, if that's truly where you think the most important issue is between the two sides of the resolution, to me, that's, that's reasonable and that's where you should focus if it is the most important. That's great. Thank you. Caleb, let's talk a little bit about argumentation. So there, we know that there are all kinds of different arguments that we make, but what constitutes a good argument in an LD debate round? Yeah, yeah, and that's a that's a tough question because there's a lot of a lot of bad arguments out there, uh, and it can be hard to distinguish between the two because sometimes good arguments sound bad and bad arguments sound good. Um, but I think the biggest thing is that uh, when you're making an argument, uh, it needs to be well supported, uh, and it needs to have an impact. Uh, if you don't meet those two criteria, then the argument is is not worthwhile. If it if it has no impact, uh, why even bring it up? If it doesn't actually matter, then it can't be a good argument. Um, and if it's not logically sound, if it's, if it's an illogical argument, then no matter how persuasive it may be, it's not a good argument and it doesn't really meet the criteria that we have for striving for truth uh, and reason. So Joel, if I were to break it down for somebody, what's required? What are the parts of a good argument? Well, you first of all want to have a very clear claim so the judge knows exactly what you're contending. And then you want to support that claim with some justification or warrant, which can be a variety of different kinds. You can quote an expert, you can make a deductive logical argument, you can have an analogy. There are various different kinds of support. And then you want to tie that argument up with a nice little bow, uh, the impact explaining to your judge exactly how this matters in the scope of your case in the entire debate round. That's great. So is there ever a place then to have cases that only use logic arguments and applications so there's no evidence provided? I think answering this question requires to differentiate between truth and persuasion, that you can have a case that's entirely logic and it will be true, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be appealing or understandable or accessible for an audience. So I think illustrations or examples are important to bridge the gap between you and your audience to make things clear, um, even though your case may be true without them. That's and great. Just to I'm... back on that, um, logic can be its own evidence, but that only works persuasively if it's self-evident. So if the audience is ready to accept that the logic of your argument already without any additional proof that can work, um, but most of the time when you're making the kinds of arguments that come up in value debate, you do want to support it with some outside sources to help lend credibility to your own reasoning. That's great. This is Shaip. I'm going to stick with you for just a moment. Can you talk a little bit about contentions? What's their purpose and how do you structure them? So contentions um, can be used in a couple of different ways. And let me just say, so that's a a contention is a piece, typically a piece of a value debate case. Um, some people can use them in different ways and there's not like a right or wrong way to organize your case. You can have different types of case structures. Uh, the way that I teach to construct the case though is to start the case with defining, define the issue, define the round, define the issue, and then that that standard for decision making that I talked about a little bit, like what's the standard? What, how are we going to know which side to choose? And then use your contentions to illustrate and support your main argument, which is your standard. So the contention, the contention is just another, another kind of an argument. And it, it gets a little bit to, to the application. So you're going to be like arguing, um, the right to know should be valued. Let's say we're saying right to know. Why? Well, because we need to uphold this value according to these standards. And then I get into the contention, I kind of apply that and I show how it works itself out in real life. So the contentions often are the longest part of the case and kind of flesh out 
the argument that you've made in your standard, but they show how the standard operates in the real world. That's great. And I understand that you have a whole session on this yes. in the intensive. So we, we have a great that. opportunity. That's excellent. We do have some questions really about advanced strategy for LD. And I want to encourage those of you who are asking those, come back to our intensive. We're going to dive much deeper into content there for the sake of this week. I'm going to move on to some questions about cross X. So Joel, we, we, we know that we want to give cross X as a time for those opponents to ask clarifying questions and to, to set up future arguments, but what happens if somebody just keeps talking? How do you graciously interrupt them when they're in the middle of speaking? So we'll be talking a lot about how to be gracious in cross X in the intensive, um, but the first preemptive strategy is to only ask questions that can be answered with a yes or no. Like make the make close ended questions, 90% of your questions to just prevent that from ever, ever happening. But if it does, keep in mind that cross X is really a persuasion game that you can lose quite easily by interrupting your opponent. So my recommendation is let them ramble. And if that continues for multiple questions, your judge will realize that your opponent is exploiting you. And you can, after three or so questions where they've rambled excessively, you can be like, excuse me, I think I need to move on for the sake of time. Um, just very politely smile, um, but give them as much latitude as you possibly can. So your judge knows that you're the nice one and they're the one that's not being gracious. Great. Caleb, let's talk about the use of Bible in, in value debate. So for this resolution specifically, do you recommend that debaters go to the Bible to understand how a public leader should act and what is required of their character? Or is, is the Bible off limits when it comes to value debate? Yeah, so, so that's, a, that's a great question. Um, I think uh, whether it's this topic specifically or any, uh, we always encourage you to go to the Bible as your source of truth. Um, it's, uh, again, we're, we're a Christian league, we believe in the authority of the Bible, uh, and so you can absolutely inform, really, and should inform everything uh, that you believe based on the Bible. Um, now, again, as, as Christy mentioned, um, with, with the, the resolution committee and, and that whole process, we make very, very certain, I would say it's probably the number one consideration that we have, is to make sure that you're never forced to debate something that is not uh, consistent with the Bible. Um, so you don't have to worry about that uh, sort of thing. And if your opponent is saying that your whole position is against the Bible, then they're wrong and you have a good opportunity to show why that's the case. Um, so we use the Bible definitely to inform our positions, to inform things like uh, the nature of man, the nature of, of, of sin and things of that, uh, of that sort. Um, and that's something that'll be, I think, relevant for this topic. Um, so we use it to support our positions, but not to sort of steamroll around and, and make it sound like your opponent is a heretic. That's great. We have so many more great questions, and unfortunately, we're not going to be, get, be able to get to all of those. So I want to invite you back. Next week, we'll be filled with lots of answers to these questions. Joel, I do want to end with this one, because I think it's, it's real in, in modern day culture. It's real in our students' lives. How do you debate respectfully, even when you disagree with someone else's position? What are some of your tips for that? First, smile a lot. Um, in round, out of round, let everyone know that you're having a good time. Um, secondly, be very cautious with the words that you use when you engage with your opponent's arguments. Don't be demeaning. Like, don't say, I eviscerated their last point. That's just rude. Um, and third, and this is something I learned in collegiate debate, believe it or not, is taking your, the best version of your opponent's argument and demonstrating how you still defeat it. So saying, even if we take my opponent at their best, uh, their best possible world, um, here's why my side is still the preferable side. Um, so not, and it's the opposite of straw manning. You might want to call it steel manning or something like that. That's great. So for those of you who want to know more resources that you can look into, I do want to encourage you to go to ncfca.org and you can find in our resource library the white paper that our debate committee put together for this issue. It has lots of recommended reading on it. Um, for those of you who are asking great resources on philosophy, Christy, do you want to give one recommendation for that? Um, I think it like democracy in America would be interesting. The founding fathers are gonna be interesting on the affirmative side. Um, John Locke and the, the kind of uh, philosophers that gave rise to those principles. On the other side, the seminal work is 
um, Warren and Brandeis, I think that's how you say it, wrote, I, I believe it's an article called Right to Privacy. It was in a law journal in the late 1800s. That's where it would start on the negative side. It's fantastic. And we want to invite you back, especially if you are parents and, and students, you want to let your parents know our next session will be addressing how can we as parents encourage our students to really evaluate the values they're using to make decisions and how can we encourage them in the activity of value debate. And then come back at 3 p.m. this afternoon. We have Hans von Spakowski of the Heritage Foundation. I had to practice saying that. Hans von Spakowski. Uh, he is just a wealth of information on elections and democratic process and privacy. So please come back and join us. We look forward to seeing you panelists. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. Thank you.